Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. It's starting to feel like fall, which is nice. The weather's cooling off. It's very enjoyable. I think pumpkins are coming out all over the place, and so we're very, very excited about the change of uh, season. We don't have a, a lot of season change, but uh, when we do have it, it's always um, great, to, great to be able to uh, enjoy that. And so we are grateful to be here this morning. We're grateful for those who have chosen to visit with us. Um, it's always an encouragement to have people come and, and spend time with us and worship with us. And I know we have a lot of folks out of town and, um, you know, the different situations like that, but we're certainly glad that you're here uh, with us this morning. Uh, Jeff will be leading us in our, in our singing, and so that'll be coming up in just a second. And so in the meantime, if we can clear our minds of any of our worldly cares, and let's focus on worshiping our, our Heavenly Father. Jeff. We're going to start off today on page 230. All hail the power of Jesus' name. <clears throat> 230. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Lord of all, ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall, hail him who saved you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all, hail him who saved you by his grace. Grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. All right, and our song before the prayer will be on page 438, More Precious Than Silver, 438. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful diamonds and nothing I desire compares with you would you bow with me our father in heaven we <clears throat> come together this morning uh, to proclaim our love for you, uh, to offer our worship to you, uh, to thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you've given us, and, Father, to ask you to watch over us and guide us uh, in our lives. Father, we uh, thank you for the privilege that we have, the freedom that we have to come together and to worship. We pray that that would always uh, be the case, that we would be free to to worship you in, in uh, openness and, and without uh, fear of harm. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to 
love one another, to uh, care for one another in this congregation. We're grateful, Father, for our church family and for uh, the uh, opportunity that we have to serve each other and to help each other and encourage each other. And we pray, Father, that we'll, we'll continue to do that. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to study and to learn uh, from the Bible, to learn from your word, uh, that we uh, learn about you and the relationship that we have with you and, and uh, how you would like us to live. And Father, help us as we continue to study and to grow and to learn. Uh, Father, we um, confess to you that we don't always live as we should. Each one of us, Father, um, sins against you, and sometimes we do that on accident, not intentionally, uh, and sometimes we do it intentionally. And we confess that, Father, to you this morning, and we know that you know it before we confess it, but we acknowledge it and we uh, ask for your continued forgiveness. And we know that we have it, Father, through Jesus, and for that we are uh, so grateful. Father, we know that uh, there's a lot of turmoil uh, in, our, in our world and in our country these days, and some of that's political, and some of it's related to the pandemic, and lots of things that are going on, Father, and uh, it's easy for us to look around and be, be fearful. It's easy for us to look around and be discouraged, and Father, we... Uh, I just want to pray that you would have your hand in all of those situations. We uh, know that so many of those, most all of those, are out of our control, but they're not out of your control. And we uh, trust you in all of those things. And Father, in the midst of those things, help us to remember as Christians that our relationship with you is not affected by that turmoil, that despite what may be going on around us, we uh, have a uh, secure relationship with you through Jesus, that you love us and have forgiven us and uh, have uh, provide us with the hope, the confident expectation of eternity with you. Father, help us to remember that and to be encouraged to go on about our lives in faith and um, in service to you, and to not be overly distraught by the things that we see. Father, as we uh, worship this morning, we continue to ask that you be with us, help our, our hearts, our minds to be uh, focused on what we're doing and thinking about you and um, what you've done for us and our love for you. We pray that what we do will be in spirit and in truth, that you will be honored and glorified by everything that we do. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our next song this morning is going to be on page 235. Praise him, praise him. <clears throat> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing o'er His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, 
prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. And our song before communion is going to be on page 88. Give thanks. 88. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. It is time for us to observe the Feast of Remembrance. And if you've got your little bag of uh, communion uh, implements, uh, we'll get them ready. I'm going to read to you this morning from Mark 14. And starting with verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he gave it to them and said, Take this, is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And as he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. You will bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we can come together at this Feast of Remembrance to honor your Son and for all that he has done for us. Father, we ask you to bless this bread, which represents Christ's body. Father, help us to remember the sacrifice that he made and in the willingness that he w was willing to die on the cross for our sins. 
Father, just help us to honor and glorify his name. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Bow with me again, please. Our Father in heaven, once again we approach your throne. Father, we ask you to bless this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's shed blood on the cross. Father, it's through your Son that we are able to know you. And Father, just help us to bring honor and glory to his name. We ask you to be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This concludes our communion service. But um, as a matter of convenience, there is a, a box in the back for those that have come prepared to make a contribution to the work of this church. And if you'll bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all of the many material blessings that you have blessed us with. Father, we just ask you to help us to give with a cheerful heart to the work of this congregation and spreading the good news. Father, we just ask you to help us to be wise in the way we handle uh, the, the gifts that you have given us. Help us to reach out to those that are in need and to spread the, the good word. Father, we're just so thankful that you loved us enough that you gave your, your son to die on the cross for us. Just help us to be wise in, in our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our song before the lesson is going to be on page 89. <clears throat> he has made me glad. Let's be standing, if you will. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Our invitation song will be on page 504, It Is Well With My Soul. Good morning. I thought Jeff was going to come back up here and preach the sermon too. I thought, have at it, brother. Come on. Last week we started a sermon series where we were talking about the Beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and um, we started that out as an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount and that's where Jesus begins his, um, his great sermon. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things I was telling Greg that, you, you know, when you read this stuff it's, it's really hard, it's really a struggle to try to preach it because there's this surface level message and then it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and and before you know it you're so deep that you think wow this i didn't know this sermon was so deep you know and you think you know if somebody preached a sermon like that today how many people would walk away with just the surface 
of a message. You know, we, we listen to sermons and we hear sermons and we walk away from sermons with, with surface level material. But my hope is always that when I get up and I preach that, that the words and the message uh, from God and, and the word of God um, instills in you a desire to go home and really dig in a little deeper. And, and I think that's what Jesus was, was doing is when he presents this message, he wants people to ask questions. He wants people to dig in a little deeper uh, and find what it truly means to be the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so we talked about the word blessed last week, and we spoke about that word and the meaning of that word and the various different ideas that come along with it, how, how these people that Jesus identifies are the blessed of God, that they are the approved of God, um, and that these people... When Jesus introduces this to the people, when he preaches this, that it was shocking, that they didn't expect this, that when, when the Messiah came, when the king came, the Jews had a, a basic expectation of who would be in the kingdom and who wouldn't be in the kingdom, that who, who the king would bless and who he wouldn't bless. And when Jesus gets up and begins to talk about these outcasts, I mean, that's really what they seem to be, it's shocking because everybody expected Jesus to come forward and start talking about the uh, people with authority, people with power and position, that those would be the blessed people of the kingdom, people with, with beautiful robes and garments that really dress the part, right? That those would be the blessed people of the kingdom, that when the Messiah came, that it would be the outwardly righteous people of society that Jesus would call to him in this mighty council to be the rulers and be the leaders of the kingdom of heaven, these wealthy and successful and prosperous people, uh, people that you would expect the Messiah to bless and, and that he would declare them righteous. But it's not what happens, is it? It's not what happens at all. In fact, when Jesus comes, he doesn't call the, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He doesn't call the elite. He calls the lowly. He calls the fishermen. He calls the average person to come and to follow him and to be part of what he is doing in the world. And when he introduces the new creation, the kingdom of heaven, he is saying that the kingdom of heaven is going to be like this. It's going to be like this, that when the new creation breaks through right in the middle of the old creation, this is what it's going to look like. And it's so shocking and it's upside down and it causes us to, to pause and question when Jesus says that the poor in spirit, that those who mourn, that the meek and the persecuted, that these are going to be the blessed ones. It really causes us to pause and think about our own life and our own expectations, and our own desires, and what are we really looking for when we are desiring the kingdom of heaven. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to read through the Beatitudes again, just one through, uh, three through 10 of the verses in chapter five, and then we will uh, talk about what it means and some of the, the ideas behind these. So verse three, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, when the question is, why are the blessed? Why are they the blessed ones, right? And the answer is, for theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we, we've heard these words hundreds of times, and we, we have sat through countless sermons as we have listened to preaching on these uh, topics, and we've heard them so many times that in our mind, these are the words of Jesus. These are the recorded words of Jesus by Matthew, and, and they've been preached, and we've heard them in sermons. But to the Jews, listening to Jesus on this day that these were first proclaimed, this was their history. This was their history. This, when they read these or heard these, they thought, this is us. 
This is who we are, that century after century and generation after generation, king after king and, and prophet after prophet, God has been continuously calling his people, begging them to be righteous, to be holy, to be a called out people that belong to him. But continuously, God's people rebelled against him and turned against him and followed their own way and not the way of righteousness. And this is really their history, that these people are the ones that, that when we talk about the wealthy, we're not talking about people who, who gained wealth by honest means or were blessed by God by wealth. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about people who, who stepped on the poor to get where they are, right? People who have become oppressive, who have hurt people, who have damaged people just so they can gain wealth and position. But what about those people who are being stepped on, right? What about those people who are being, being persecuted by those who desire power and wealth? What about them? And that's what this is all about, that the Jews knew that throughout history that there have been people who desired to be righteous. And they wanted to be blessed by God, but they wanted to be blessed by God by honest means. They wanted to be upright. They wanted to be representatives of God's goodness and his righteousness and his holiness. But then there's this other group who's constantly putting people down and destroying people and killing people. In some cases, because they desire to be like God. And instead of being a light to the nations around them, Israel becomes the darkness. They become the darkness. And, and to people who are supposed to be upholding God's goodness and righteousness, they become just the opposite of that. They do not champion God's goodness and righteousness. And time and time again, they fail. They fail to do the will of God. And, and they give in to the temptation and draw themselves into the darkness. Their appetite, it's not for righteousness. It's not what it was for. But their appetite was for wickedness. And then Jesus comes, right? We, we know this. It's so good. Jesus comes on the scene, and, and he comes to be the very Israel that God desired Israel to be. And, and Jesus comes, and he comes to be the light that God desired Israel to be. To be truly Israel is to be like Jesus. To be truly righteous is to be like Jesus. To be truly like God is to be like Jesus. And then Jesus calls groups of people out of the darkness and says, come on, follow me, be like me, join me as we bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. As we, as we go about our society and our, and our home and our community and our businesses and, and we live the kingdom life in the present age so that the kingdom is coming through you and through me. And Jesus calls people out of the darkness into light to follow him to be the light, to be the new Israel, to do what Israel failed to do and to show the world who God truly is. And those who choose not to do that, those who choose not to be that kind of person, well, they just won't be in the kingdom, right? They're just not gonna be part of it. And that's how God deals with that. It's not going to be positions of power and positions of, of pining for position. They're not gonna be trying to climb up the corporate ladder, but the lowliest of citizens becomes the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus comes to sh not only to show that, but to call people to join him in what he is doing in the world. So here's our question this morning. How are we supposed to respond? How are we supposed to respond to those who have rejected God's justice? How are we supposed to respond to those who true choose to, to make themselves righteous? or those who choose to climb the corporate ladder on the backs of the poor and oppressed. And how, do we, how do we respond to that? I mean, really, how do we deal with that as a society, as a people? Because more often than not, don't you feel kind of helpless in the situation? 
I mean, don't you feel like it's sometimes a hopeless situation? You, you want things to be better. You want things to be good. You want fairness. You want justice. You want it all to be right. But it's just not right. And you don't know how to fix it. And I don't know how to fix it. And I wish there was a way to, to fix it. But isn't that what the church is all about? That as a community, within a community, that we come together and we, we champion God's righteousness right here right? That all of us become equal, that all of us, regardless of our status in society, that we all bow the knee to King Jesus, that we all do what's right and uphold what is good and be a light to our community as a small little group. But our hope as we come together every first day of the week and we remind each other of this and we encourage each other and we strengthen each other, our hope is that light begins to spread and to grow throughout our community and throughout our world. And that someday the light will be the only thing visible, that the darkness will be gone. And that's the hope of the kingdom, isn't it? It starts out so small, Jesus says, like a little mustard seed. But then it grows and it grows like leaven inside of dough and it spreads and it spreads. But how, in the meantime, do we deal with the unrighteousness and injustice, the wicked that so hunger for wickedness that they're willing to devour the righteous in the process? Turn with me to Psalms 37. The Psalm 37. Now, the psalmist is talking about this very thing, and he's, he's discussing this concept of, of evildoers and the righteous. They're, they're kind of caught in the middle, right? They're kind of stuck there, and it seems like they're helpless. It seems like they have no power, and the reality is they are helpless, and they have no power. But the psalmist introduces hope into the world of brokenness. So let's read that together. Psalm Psalm 37, starting in verse 1, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers. Now that word fret is the concept of, of burning with anger. That, that you see evildoers, you see wickedness, and you are so, oh, it's so angry. It's so infuriating. It, it's so <sighs> discouraging that, that it burns within you, that you so much do you want to take care of this? So much do you want to make things right? So much do you want to see things better that you fret over evildoers? And then he says, be not envious of wrongdoers. Be not envious. Now look at verse 2. Oh, excuse me. Verse 2. It says, for, for they, that's the evildoers, the wrongdoers, they will wither and quickly like grass and fade like the green herb. So it's easy to become angry, isn't it? It's easy to become infuriated. It's easy to become envious of those who seem to be doing good and making it in life, even though they're doing so by dishonest means. And the psalmist says, well, you know, whatever they have or, or whoever they are, it's only temporary, right? That they're getting their reward right now. That they're getting their riches right now. That they're having their good life right now. And he says it's only temporary because like grass, they're going to wither, right? We know what that looks like. I mean, we have a hard time growing grass anyway in this part of the country. And, and when it starts to wither and dry up and you're thinking, man, how do you get it to, to come back again? And it's dead. And it blows away with the wind into the neighbor's yard, usually with the stickers and all of that. And then the green herbs, they just fade away. All of these things, he says, it's just like that. It, it's just going to go away. And then he says in verse 3, he says, trust. Trust. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. See, isn't that the thing that we're supposed to be doing? Aren't we supposed to be here in the community regardless of what's going on around us or regardless of the injustice, regardless of, of righteous, wicked people? What do we do? We, we trust, and we wait, and we sit here, and we cultivate faithfulness and goodness. And then in verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5, and for these people, the desires of the heart, that's not riches and wealth, that's not what they're desiring. They just want peace. That's their desire. They want peace to live and do good for God. Verse 5, 
Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. Some translations say that he will act, that God's going to respond to this, that God is going to do something, that he will act. In verse 6, he says, He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. So instead of burning with anger, right? I mean, over a hopeless, helpless situation, instead of burning with anger, instead of becoming jealous, what do they do? They trust in the Lord, right? They do good. They cultivate faithfulness. They delight in the Lord. And it seems so simple, doesn't it? When we say it that way, when we read this and we're thinking, yeah, I could do that. That's easy. I'm, I'm good with that. I can, I can sit here and just be good and do what I'm supposed to do and, and you know, be the righteousness of God and, and regardless of what's going on around me. It seems easy. It seems simple. But when you, when you have people crying out murderous threats against you, when you have people crying out murderous threats against you, when the world around you has chosen and to be in sin and they're comfortable with it, right? That's their, that's their security blanket. They love sin. They desire it. And they live in it. And, and when they hate you for trusting in God, when they hate you for being different, when they hate you, when they see your life and they say, it's how I should be living. I don't want to live that way. And in a sense, you're kind of judging them by just being good. You're not saying anything to them, but your life is a judgment against their life. And they hate you for that. And they resent you for that. When it looks like the evil is winning, it's not so simple anymore, is it? It's so seemingly simple when you say it, and then when you live it, it's like, oh, that's not so easy. That's hard. That's difficult. It's challenging for all of us. In verse 7, the psalmist says, rest. Rest. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Waiting patiently. <laughs> how easy is that? I mean, how good are we are waiting for things? You know, I, I get maybe we're better at it now. We've been waiting for, you know, seven plus months, you know, for things to kind of get back to normal. So we, but waiting is so hard. We're so impatient, aren't we? We want everything to happen now. We want it all to come, come now. Just give it to me right now. I want it. I want peace and I want it now. And we have to wait. The psalmist says, just wait, just rest, rest in the Lord, wait patiently, do not fret, do not worry. And so often, so often, what do we want to do? We want to take matters into our own hands, don't we? We, we want to take matters into our own hands. We want to take care of it ourselves. We want to get up and, and we want to cry out vengeance against those who are oppressing us or those who are wickedly obtaining wealth. And we want to take, we want to take vengeance on them. We want to deal with them. Those people who are strangling our peace, we want to deal with. And we want to get them out of the picture. And we want to take matters into our own hands. But the people of God... That's not how they work. <laughs> That's not how we are supposed to be. The people of God, the faithful, they wait. And they wait patiently for the Lord. But look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. Do not fret. Do not burn with anger. Because it leads only to what? What does it lead to? evil doing. Isn't that so true? Isn't, isn't that what it leads to? You know, I, I don't talk politics. It's not really my thing. You know, that's, that's Greg's thing. So Greg can talk politics. But I don't talk politics. But you know, the fa Facebook is so full of politics right now, isn't it? And it's so infuriating. Because you keep reading things and you're looking at things, but you even see Christians who, who hate each other. And you see Christians who are ugly towards others because of differences of opinions. And it's so, you read these things and you think, is this what God wants us to do? Is this how God wants us to be as the people 
of the kingdom? Are we supposed to be this, this way? Or are we supposed to wait and be the righteousness of God and be the goodness of God and be patient and know that whatever evil is being done, that whatever unrighteousness is happening, that whatever, whatever happens, you know, come November, that, that God is going to act somehow at some point at time that God's going to deal with it. Now, it may not even be in this lifetime, right? It may not be in our generation. It may not be in any generation that we know of that we can foresee. But someday, someday, when the kingdom truly does break through and it is the only kingdom, God will act and justice will be served. And those of us who have faithfully, patiently waited on the Lord, we will see it and we will have peace. And we need to think about that. We need to rest. We need to rest. But we become so impatient, right? And we want to take matters into our own hands and we burn with anger. But the end, the end of that kind of attitude is we become just like them. We become just like the evildoers. In verse 9, he says, For evildoers will be cut off. That's, that's what the Lord says, right? The evildoers, yeah, they look like they're strong, they look like they're powerful, it looks like they're getting ahead, it looks like they're winning but they will be cut off. They will be removed. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. They will inherit the land. Yet a little while, verse 10, and the wicked man will be no more. And, and you, you'll look carefully for him. You're going to look around for the wicked man and you're going to look for him in his place where he would normally be on the high places on his throne. And guess what? He's not going to be there. It's not going to be anywhere, but God will take care of them, right? God's going to take care of the wicked. He is going to take care of vengeance for us. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, right? He's the only one who can rightfully judge another. Isn't that true? He's the only one that knows a person's heart so well, that knows the situation so well, that he can enact judgment that is so perfect and so righteous. Only he is able to do that. We try, we do our best, right? We use God's word, we use common sense, and we try to enact judgment. But God is the only one who can truly do that. And in his world, things are good, <laughs> right? In verse 11, verse 11, it says, But the humble, or the meek, the humble, the meek, will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant Prosperity. Now, this is the passage that Jesus quotes in Matthew 5 and verse 5, that the meek will inherit the earth. But who are the meek, right? That's always the big question, isn't it? We've always kind of asked that question. Well, what does that mean? And we've changed the meaning of the word a little bit to try to, try to say, well, it's gentle or it's humble or something like that. But the word meek had a very distinct meaning. And you may have heard the phrases like uh, in an attempt to describe what meekness is, that meekness is power under control. That's, I've used that before. I've, you know, I've power under control, that meekness is not weakness. We've said that to try to help explain what meekness really means. But here's my favorite definition. The meek are those who patiently endure the present in light of the future. That's the meek. They, they patiently endure the present in light of the future. And, and so the, the meek are those who are just, they're just patiently waiting, right? They're being persecuted. They're being attacked. They're, they're helpless. But they're waiting patiently for God to act. In the middle of persecution, in the middle of, of an evil, perverse world, they patiently wait for God to act. The meek are patient. They're patient, and they're patiently waiting for God to rescue them, to bring them out of this situation, to take them out of this broken world. And really, the meek are powerless. It's not necessarily power under control because they're powerless. They're helpless. They have no power over those who are oppressing them. They have no choice but to wait, to rest, and trust that God is going to deal with the situation. So they patiently wait and they endure. The meek, the meek are those who are completely and totally dependent upon God. And they wait, 
Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, the wicked, oh, they're still, they're still active, aren't they? Regardless of how patient we might be, they're still working. The wicked, they plot against the righteous. They plot against the righteous and they gnash at them with their teeth. And guess what the Lord does? He, he laughs at them. He just laughs at them. He sees their efforts and he, he sees what they're trying to do and he sees that, that they're oppressing people and hurting people, but he knows, doesn't he? Ultimately, God knows. He knows that, that even though they think in their mind, in their heart, that they're winning, even though they think they're getting the upper hand, even though they think because of, of everything they've done and all the, the power they have and the wealth that they have obtained through dishonest means that, that God is blessing them. And they think, we're going to win. We're going to be victorious. We've got this. And God laughs at them. He, he just looks at it, but he says, this, this is hilarious. I can't believe you think this way. God, God sees their efforts. But the question is why? Why would, his, why would God laugh at these people? And the answer is in the next, the next verse, He's, or next part of the verse. He says, for he sees his day is coming. <laughs> right? But that's what we want, isn't it? I mean, as people who are of the world, in the world, but, but the world around us becomes increasingly wicked, and we want, we want to see their day coming. We want to see it. God says, I already see it. I, from where I sit in heavenly places, I look at the world and I already see it. So I, I laugh at their efforts. Don't worry about them. I've got this thing taken care of, right? Verse 14. The wicked have drawn the sword, bent their bow, cast down the afflicted and the needy to slay those who are upright in conduct. That's what they've done. They, they, think, they think they're winning. They think by, by drawing out their sword that they're going to be more powerful. They think by drawing back their bow that they're going to be victorious. And, and the afflicted and the needy, well, they're just an inconvenience. They're just a means to an end sometimes for those who desire this kind of wealth. But look at verse 15. Verse 15 says that their sword that they have drawn will enter their own heart. And their bow, it will be broken. You see, the meek, right? The afflicted, the needy, those who are patiently waiting for the Lord, they, they don't burn with anger against their persecutor. They don't burn with anger against those who are oppressing them. They don't seek revenge in wrath because they know that that leads to evil doing. And they know that those who do evil in the end are not going to make it. That they're not going to win. That God laughs at them. And that the means to the end, right, is not to take matters into our own hands, but to wait for the Lord. And He will take care of the evildoers. And even their own swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Let's skip down to verse 35. Skip down to verse 35. He says, I have, I have seen the wicked, violent man, the psalmist says. I've seen him. I, I know what he looks like. Everybody knows what he looks like. He's, he's out there parading around as if he's, he's big stuff. You know, he's, he's, he's the guy. He's the one. He's powerful. And he says, spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in his native soil. Right? We talked about this in Psalm 73. That that the psalmist even saw this there, that it seems like, you know, from, from man's point of view, that these people are really getting ahead. And often it looks like the wicked are winning, that they're being victorious, that crime truly does pay, right? We always say that crime doesn't pay, but then when you see some people, you think, you know, sure pays pretty well for them, right? And, and sometimes we see that in the world, that the faithful are just wasting their time. Remember what the psalmist said. It seems like I'm wasting my time with my faithfulness because I just keep getting pushed down and they keep going up and I don't understand what's going on. But, but, look at the next verse, 36. But then he passed away. That's it. I mean, it's that simple. You know, the, God, God's looking at this and he's saying that, yes, now he looks like this beautiful tree. He's luxuriant. He's stretched out all over the land. And, and he seems like he has the best of everything. And he seems like that the needy are just, are just his slaves. 
But just wait. Someday you will look and he would have passed away. He's gone. And lo, he was no more. I sought for him. I looked around. But I couldn't find him. He was gone like, like the grass, right? That, that withers it, and the herb that fades. He's gone. No more. Verse 37. He says, Mark the blameless man and hold the upright, for the man of peace will have posterity. The man of peace will have posterity. And verse 38. But transgressors will all be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation, the salvation of the righteous is from who, church? It's from the Lord. He will rescue us. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. He, he's their power. They're meek. They're helpless. They're powerless. But God's on their side. And they wait for God to act. And he will. And he, his strength is their strength. Verse 40, the Lord helps them, delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. These meek who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who mourn over the brokenness of the world, they wait patiently. They wait patiently and they endure hardship in the present age because they know Right? They know that their God is going to act. They know that God is going to deal with all of this. They know what the future holds. I was thinking about this this morning. I was thinking about how would my life be different if I could go back in the past uh, with all the knowledge I have now and knowing how the future is going to unfold, just go back to the past and relive it. Ever thought about that? You ever thought about how that would change you in the present? How the present reality changes when you know the future results? And the reality is, that's the meek, aren't, isn't it? That's, those are the people who are presently here. Us, we, the church, we know the future, right? We know that God's going to deal with all of this. We know who wins in the end. And so we can patiently wait in the present because we know what the future holds for us. And I was thinking about Revelation chapter 6. We've been going through the book of Revelation on Wednesday. In Revelation chapter 6, John has this vision and he sees the, the slain Lamb of God, the only one who is truly worthy to open the seals of the scroll, of the sacred scroll. And when you get down to verse 9, we have this fifth scroll that the seal is broken and it's revealed to the people. In verse 9, John records this for us his vision. And it says, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Their, their good confession, right? That Jesus is Lord. That, that righteousness belongs to Jesus. That following Jesus is true righteousness and that, and that the emperor has no power, right? And so they've maintained this and they have been killed for that. They've been martyred. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long? How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long? How long will injustice continue? How long will the afflicted, the needy, the upright have to endure abuse from the enemies. How long? How long will we suffer? How long will mourners mourn? How long will the meek endure? How long until the hunger, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are going to be satisfied? Lord, how long? How long do we have to wait? Then in verse 11, and there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest. I love that word. I just, I just like saying it, you know, just the idea of rest. How good is that? 
Just rest for a little bit longer. Just rest for a while until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Just rest. Just wait. That even though you have been slain at the hands of the wicked, it's not the end. Right? Be patient. But still, we, we cry out, don't we? We mourn for injustice and we say, how long will this continue, Lord? How long will we have to wait? The psalmist says the salvation of, of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Folks, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, our response our response to evildoers, our response to wickedness, our response to injustice is not to burn with anger. It's not to fret. It's not to become envious of the wicked people. It's not to take matters into our own hands, but it's to rest. It's to wait. It's to be patient. It's to trust in the Lord and do good and wait and he will act. He will act. Folks, what we have in the Lord, what we have in Jesus, what we have in the kingdom far outweighs whatever we might endure in the present. Don't you agree? That, that all of that we endure in the present age, whatever it might be, it doesn't hold a candle to what is coming in the future. That even in the present age, as we are currently citizens of the kingdom, that what we have in Jesus far outweighs whatever they can throw at us. Whatever evil comes our way, whatever heartache we may have to endure, blessed, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Take a deep breath. Just wait. Be patient. Rest. And God will bring salvation. Have peace in knowing this. If there's anybody here this morning who has not put on Jesus in baptism and clothed yourself with the robe of Jesus and become part of the kingdom of heaven, if you have not entered through that process and been cleansed of all of your sins, if that is your desire this morning, become part of the, the family of God, or if you need prayers from the congregation for strength and encouragement, we're here for you. Please come forward as we stand and as we sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, Once again to everybody, especially if we have any visitors, uh, you're more than welcome. We hope you can join us again and uh, remind you if you have not ever filled out a visitor's card, please fill out one and uh, leave it in the box in the back. Uh, 
I'm going to leave most of the news and notes for your own reading. I will just point out we've uh, got uh, three updates on new addresses in there to please take note and correct your records. Uh, Luana is going to be spending most of her time in Oklahoma, and the Carpenters have a new address, and uh, the Kretzes have a new address. So please uh, take note of them, and we've got... Uh, several <clears throat> on our prayer list and uh, Emery, Emery Strother uh, asked us to uh, add to our prayer list a good friend of his uh, a lady by the name of Bunny Bryce has been uh, diagnosed with liver cancer and a uh, pretty serious condition for her so we want to add her to our prayer list. That's uh, all I have unless somebody has something that uh, they would like to bring to our attention. Thank you. Our closing song today is going to be on page 480, Victory in Jesus. If y'all would, let's be standing. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me Plunged me to victory. 